Hey folks, thanks for stopping by Kaiser's Castle. Today, myself and Baz, we're going to talk about the uh, what we have seen as the progress of soldier and police gear. And also we might touch on a little tactics and uh, we'll just try to give you, from our perspective of, with me, 30, 34 years of uh, watching things move around uh, my thoughts on it and I'll let Baz uh, tell you a little bit about uh, his experience and and uh, I'll let him matter of fact I'll let him kick it off because he comes from across the pond and he comes from the day from when uh, DPM pattern cami was uh, standard issue and then I, I might link into what I did you know earlier so, with that being said, hey Baz, why don't you introduce and explain to the folks, you know, your years of experience and whatnot, brother. Cheers, brother. Thanks. Good to be back on the, uh, the Big Orange Couch. Yeah, it's, uh, we have touched on this on, on like in and out of this show before, you know, um, in our different conversations on different shows. And uh, basically, we just thought, oh, we might as well just put it all together um, into a show where we can dedicate a good... Uh, a, a good session where we can touch on the certain things that we've seen change over our time um, in our respective um, environments. Um, obviously, I've been, I've been on a good few of your shows, um, and if, if the people listening don't know, um, I spent 25 years in the British Army, primarily as a combat infantryman, um, and within within those 25 years a good 15 years of those were spent as an instructor in various forms of warfare um, for different um, agencies and elements of the British Armed Forces primarily again um, circulating around sort of UK special forces and frontline frontline units um, in and around sort of mobility warfare using weapons platforms and, and, and the like um, and, and again Outside of sort of like the Afghanistan Iraq sphere, um, I did quite a lot of work um, in, in Northern Ireland, both um, as a green role, as, as we'll say, in uniform and um, covertly in in plain clothes. So th there's been quite a lot of um, changes over the years that I've spent in the military, certainly in in, in my sphere, um, and for the better. It's not gotten worse no matter what the old and bold will say, the old and bold will always say they had it worse in their day, they had it worse in their day. Um, I'm one of the old and bold, and I've seen sort of the old and the new. Um, and again, it's something that we'll touch on. Um, we could touch on the, the kit that we used back in the day when we first sort of joined up and we were started um, carrying out operations to the kit, the kit that the, 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 the guys and girls are using now um, and, and how, how effective it is. Um, in the long run so i mean the first thing that, that that comes to mind when people think of gear um when it comes to sort of the armed forces is certainly first first thing they see is the uniform that we're wearing um like so when i joined the army back in um the the, the early the early 90s it was um, the old dpm pattern disrupt, disruptive pattern material um like the old woodland stuff um quite similar to the old, your old bdu pattern um you know the old woodland pattern of that um, and, and it's something that we'd had since the 50s, um, early 60s, all the way through to to, to, to pretty much the um, mid 2000s, 2000 sort of like, um, up to about 2009, 2010, something like that, when we changed over to the multi-pattern um, camouflage. Uh, we, again, we were one of the first sort of armed forces in, in the world to, to adopt the old multi-pattern camouflage, pretty much that you used to see on the cry kit that the SF cats were cutting around in um, and, and it's because it's multi-terrain pattern as we call it MTP it, it, it does the job all over the world um, so and especially those who have worked with British forces will have seen that we had the old DPM pattern like the woodland pattern then we had sort of the desert pattern that some of um, the listeners might have seen our guys wearing out in a sort of Afghanistan and Iraq places like that and then we had um, we had a jungle pattern which was 
pretty much the same as a DPM pattern, but the colours were sort of brighter. They were as subdued, obviously, because of the, of the terrain that we're operating in. Um, but they were sort of wide, widespreadly issued, the jungle pattern, purely because um, it was primarily for sort of special forces and, and the frontline units, and they were quite old to get, get uh, sorry, they're quite hard to get hold of. Um, so if you got a, pa- uh, a set of junglies, that we used to call them junglies, um, basically they were, they were like rocking off shit, so you you looked after them. Um, and so it was like that, the changes in uniform, and we didn't always wear um, camouflage uniform around around barracks when we were on um, exercise or operations. We used to have what was called working dress, which was like um, olive drab green sort of denims, you know, um, like like pants, and then um, the same colour shirt. And then we used to have this woolen jumper that I fucking absolutely detested, but a lot of people um, sort of really liked it. And it's still part of the uniform today, if you so wish. Um, <clears throat> but we, we, we as, as British, British troops, we really liked the old school sort of the BDU pattern um, that, that the US guys were wearing. Um, and obviously then they went to the AC, ACUs, this, this green digital, uh, grey digital stuff. And we were baffled why your guys were wearing it. Um, <coughs> it was like, what the fuck are you guys wearing that? And most of the, the cats I was working with from the US, um, so especially guys from like 82nd Airborne and people out there were looking at us and going, we don't fucking know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Basically, it's, it's um, lowest bidder one. And we were rocking around with this fucking grey shit on, which it only has very, very limited use or um, effectiveness in, in certain areas. Um, the only thing I've ever like, seen that camouflage work on is a couch. There's a meme where a guy's like, yeah, I've, on a I've couch. seen that. Yeah, yeah I've seen that. Um, and it works quite fucking effectively on that couch. That's it. Uh, yeah. Again, if, if, if you're working in sort of um, temperate urban environments, like say um, North America, Northern Europe, you know what I mean, where there's a lot of rubble. Um, then, then yeah, it's it's going to be effective. But to be honest, anywhere else, especially places like Afghanistan and that, it was it was pretty garbage. You know, it was it was quite garbage. So, ah, uh, there there were the guys that was to do it, changing over to sort of your multi-terrain pattern, um, sort of the cry the cry kit multi-terrain pattern, um, camouflage. That it was sort of a, a, a welcome, a, a welcome blessing that they're out of that shit. Again, then, then the, the the guys, especially like sort of the army guys, were looking at the the marines and what they had, and there was there was an element of jealousy there, I think, because the marines obviously their BDUs were a lot better than the um it was like is it the Marpat camouflage pattern? I think is that, is that what they call it nowadays, the Marpat stuff? Yeah, you have Marpat, um, uh, Digi Desert Cams, and you also have Camis, and you also have yeah. uh, Marpat uh, Digi Woodland. Now, the one thing I uh, wanted to touch on real quick, you guys call it uh, MTPs. And uh, in the U.S., when it first came out, it was called uh, Multicam. And, uh, you know, it was better than the ACU, but it's pretty much standardized now into what's now known globally because so many forces are using it by us as scorpion patterns just because of how a lot of the different colors will have those little tells weaving off of them. And uh, I guess that's the reason why, from what I heard from somebody who worked at Natec once, you know, where they develop camouflage patterns. So, you know, that's just my two cents. Keep rocking, brother. Yeah, obviously, on on that subject, it was, um, obviously, it it was sort of like, Cry, Cry Industries that first came out with the pattern, the multi-terrain pattern, multi-cam sort of um, pattern template. And when we when we switched over to multi-terrain pattern, um, Cry Industries weren't too happy about it. Um, and a lot of sort of to and fro in came, like a copyright and trademark and stuff like that. But basically the, the British government turned around and went, look, we don't give a fuck, you're an American company. We're a British fucking... Um, we're the British Armed Forces. We haven't copied you. We're just doing quite similar, you know. Um, so I don't know what what came of it, but obviously we're still using it. I think quite Cry Industries was sort of like fucking told to wind the necks in, um, because at the time Cry Industries obviously did have a, a contract with 
United Kingdom Special Forces. So again, I think that was held in jeopardy. They were just like, look, we're still happy to get Crikey. We aren't going to issue all Special Forces MTP. Um, you know what I mean? As 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 a whole. Um, so either I think wind your necks in, or we'll just cut strings on your contract. So it sort of went away. But if you look at the MTP pattern, I'd like to like if you look at the old the, the, the map at, they've got the, the the globe and anchor on there, haven't they? Well, it's quite similar with our um, our MTPs. If you look in the pattern, you'll see MT, MT all over it, as if for multi-terrain. Um, I don't know whether that was the, an outcome of the this sort of cry industries um, MOD legal fucking battle. I'm not sure. Um, but again, if you look at those combats, and I, I like the MTP combats. I think they're, they're a better pattern. They work all over the world. Um, there's not many places they don't really work. Um, but again, it, it's it's the, that evolving of of uniform that helps the the soldier on the ground do the job better, you know. Um, and let's be honest, the old ACUs, you know, that that the the army guys were cutting around with over over, over your side of the pond, fucking failed nearly at every hurdle. Um, yeah, ACUs for again, shit. Just for clarification for the people listening. A jumper is a sweater in English, in in proper English, Englishman's English, not American English. And uh, the other thing, MOD is Ministry of Defense. Rock on. Yes. Yeah, I should have I should have made that clear. My apologies. Um, yeah. So uh, the the, this, the uniform that we're, the guys the guys and girls are wearing today are a lot better. Um, they tend to be listening a lot more to. The, the soldier on the ground rather than some lab technician thinking this is a really good idea when that certain lab technician has not even spent a, a, an hour on the ground um, working as a soldier. And it goes um, along with some of our vehicles as well. The Brits have learnt the fucking hard way um, when it comes to our vehicles that we're using out in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I mean, you, you saw... You, you saw guys and girls over in Iraq when you were first over there, driving around in soft skin Land Rovers open top Land Rovers you know, with no wep- no weapon systems on the just soft skin Land Rovers and I know there's was, there was guys and girls getting shot at when everybody else is rolling around in lumps of armour, you know, so and then what, because the British Army is fucking cheap, they started using our world uh, up armoured Land Rovers from Northern Ireland that were um, designed for a public order role, if you know what I mean, um, for sort of riots where they stop bricks and bottles and things like that. They weren't designed to take high velocity rounds and IEDs. And unfortunately we lost quite a few people in those. Um, but again, the, the, the MOD sort of fingers in the ears, la 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 la, didn't want to know about it until it was plastered all over our sort of mainstream media, um, that our boys and girls are getting killed because the British army or the, um, the ministry of defense, I should say, was too fucking cheap to actually buy armoured vehicles for our people on the ground. Um, so then what they did, instead of actually asking people, the guys and girls on the ground, what do you think we should be doing? They designed a whole raft of vehicles that basically were, were garbage, okay? They were absolutely garbage. Um, some of some of the uh, people listening might have seen the old German Pinsgauers. Well, we, the British Army, used quite a lot of Pinsgauers, but what they decided to do was just slap a load of slab armour all over them and just say, there you, there you go, you know, no, without doing much to the, the, the transmission, the engine. So you had this 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 vehicle that was designed to be light and uh, nimble cross-country, all of a sudden weighs about two or three tonnes more without the people inside it, um, and it was an absolute fucking garbage piece of kit, absolutely garbage. Um, and I had friends actually killed in that vehicle. Um, and it was sort of after that where it was like, look, yes, you give us a new vehicle and you you put bells and whistles all over it, but it's still the same vehicle underneath and it's still a piece of shit that it's not fit for role. Um, again, when people were dying, it was in the press. And again, it, it's sort of the outrage of the public that's turned around and said, we're paying you our tax pounds, our tax dollars. Why aren't you using them to protect the people we're sending to war? You know, and then it was oh, oh, okay, okay. And then somebody actually had the bright idea: why don't we actually ask them what they fucking want? So again, 
um, certainly in places called um, ATDU, the Armoured Trials and Development Unit, and the ITDU, which is the Infantry Trials and Development Unit, I was I was part of for a number of years. Um, they started asking 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 us, what do you guys want? What do you think is going to work on the ground? Um, and it was sort of the big list that we gave them. This is what we're looking for. Um, go and find us it. And then obviously the, the tender contracts and all these companies go, oh, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. Um, but again, at the end of the day, palms get greased, no matter what country you live in, palms get greased. And, and the, the best idea that we think is not always the best idea because it might be too expensive or yada, yada, yada. But we've all, we've all said, how many, how, many, how many millions of pounds are you willing to throw at people's lives? You know, yeah, you might, you might pay an extra £400,000 for this vehicle or an extra £80,000 for this vehicle, but at the end of the day, it's going to do its job properly. So it's it's always been that sort of battle with us. Um, and certainly the, the American guys, everybody from um, just, just normal ground-holding units, normal infantry units up to your special forces, have always said, you guys are fucking crazy. There's no way we're going to roll around in your top vehicles. Um, like the Jackal, which is our, I know you've put pictures on your shows before, the, the ones I've sent you of, of the Jackal that I used to um, work out of, which is a big supercar open topped vehicle, just bristling with weapons. And then we've got the sort smaller ones, the Arrow Mix, um, which are basically a Land Rover with the top chopped off it, which is up armoured, V shaped hull with all the weapons on it. The ones that you used to see in the first Gulf War um, with the SAS, but obviously the, there's, there's been a few more generations of those um and i was always an advocate of that you know it's all right being wrapped in armor and especially the guys uh, that have served in iraq that uh, that have uh, are listening um if you're wrapped in armor you're very reactive and you, you can't be really proactive where you ro- roll around in an open top vehicle you know you need to be in tune with the environment um and you sort of you absorb it easily. You know it's gonna. You know it. Something's gonna go wrong, because you are encased in, in in armor. If you know what I mean. Just looking out the little portholes. You're out. You're looking around. You've got 360 vision. Your gunner's on top. He's looking around. You've got maybe a guy in the back on the rear gun, depending on what variant you're using. Um, and, and you, you tend to know that it's gonna kick off before it does. So you can be. <laughs> Either proactive or you, your reaction time is a lot quicker. You know where you're getting engaged from, and therefore you can utilise the threat a lot quicker using the, you uh, get a, the different weapon systems you've got on your weapons platform. You get um, better. You get a and better. That's just some of the things we've all we've always had comms issues in in the army. You get a better. And I dare say that's that's not just the British army. I dare say that's the US army, the Canadian, anywhere that you go. But they've, they've thrown billions at this thing that we've got. We've got these nowadays called Bowman, um, and it's ever so many billion over, pro, over 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 budget. It came in late, and to be honest, it was just it's just you get a better too fiddly. You get a better read on the street. <laughs> uh, in my experience, if you're out there more open, you get a better read on the street. You know, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan both. The people don't have poker faces unless they're trained, <clears throat> but the mass majority aren't, and they're very group think like. So you'll ever you'll <clears throat> you'll usually have everybody throwing you the hate eyes, which are famous over there, or there'll be nobody on the street. Uh, what you were talking about with the applique armor that the soldiers were putting on, we had the same thing in America. Even though AM General and General Dynamics teamed up. Back in the uh, when the uh, Hummer first came out, there were up armors available. A lot, there were several of them uh, that were uh, actually uh, fielded in uh, before the fall of the wall in Germany, and a few even made their ways into um, uh, Berlin. Uh, then uh, went into the Marine Corps and saw more variants of Hummers than I even did in the Army. Uh, just because their uh, Hummers have to be outfitted for uh, going into water. So they all had fording kits on them, which was unique. I'd never seen that in the Army. Um, but then, uh, and never driven anything like that, which the fording kit for the uh, air intake has a big tube that protrudes. So if you're the driver, 
your right side vision is somewhat impaired instead of just having that brace for the roof coming up you now have this big ass tube i think it's like six seven inches around in circumference um and then the other thing with the applique armor uh just like you were saying the transmissions the uh braking system believe this or not uh the braking system would overheat really quickly with these people that use the applique armor where they just bolted the shit on uh we used to call them franken vehicles and also the uh actual um uh, what do you call that shit? Um, the uh, uh, suspension. The suspensions would break down really quickly. The springs and the uh, uh, shocks. And so they were a rough ride. Uh, so what we did, and the hard cars were fine, except they, they were gleaming targets. We had this big antenna on everybody's hard car that I've ever seen. Who I worked around. There was this... Um, the antenna went with a system called Godan, I believe it was called. Codan, C-O-D-A-N. And uh, that big antenna st sat on the front bush guard. And you could spot those cars from a mile away. And this is before the days of the uh, Mavericks or the Dukes being put on vehicles. And we can get into that in a little bit. But the whole point was that was just ECM. Uh, electrical electronic countermeasures and usually it was to disrupt uh, uh, mines that might be detonated by uh, or IEDs or EF, EFPs whatever that might be detonated by cell phones so that's why that technology came into four but our work around oh those Franken vehicles too by the way because the suspension and the, and the frames even weren't tough enough to hold that weight especially with the Hummers, it was not uncommon to see those things split right down the middle of the undercarriage. That's a no bullshit story. You know how many times I've seen those vehicles thrown on a flatbed to be, you know, put in the little junk piles they had like in Mosul, Baghdad, Air, uh, Biop, uh, and a few other places. Um, but yeah, there'd be stockyards full of that shit that just cracked and broke. And uh, that wasn't weapons, or that wasn't damage from the enemy. That was damage from all the weight on the damn things. But our work around, when I was in Coot, we bought a, uh, we all pulled our money, and we were able to buy a um, um, Hilux, a Hilux pickup, a tw twin cab, uh, just a normal one, one of those orange uh, Fender taxis, and a Toyota um minivan that the windows basically were blacked out you know with that film they put on them over there and you just blended in and uh you know people may have thought oh wow these people are coming somebody might have been watching uh let's say camp delta if we're leaving out of alcoot and headed to adiwania um all in wasit province if somebody was on the horn saying all oh, these vehicles just left if you know, by the time they see your plate number, it's too late. You've passed up their trap because they're not going to be that close to it to see, to set it off. So, your thoughts, brother? Yeah, I mean, I say it's always best to have that sort of like low profile, isn't it? You know, if you if you afforded that opportunity to do so. But again, like I say, most of the time conducting operations out in sort of Iraq and Afghanistan, you weren't offered that. That you know, I mean, you you were rocking around in Humvees or larger vehicles or British Army Land Rovers or our weapons platforms, you know. So it was it was basically you had to wait for it. But I agree what you said, where you have you have a good feel of the atmospherics if you you're sitting in an open vehicle. And certainly the um, the Marsoc guys that we had attached to us, uh, some of the first recon, uh, the force recon, and some of the um, the ODA guys that that were in the vehicles with us. After a while of like operating it with it for, for for a week or so, there was like you know something. You guys are right. You know what I mean. We can see what you mean now by you're a lot more um, in tune. You've you've got the pulse of the area um, a, a lot a lot sort of um, pinned down rather than being encased in these vehicles. But there's sometimes where we looked and think we would rather be in 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Wrapped in armor. Certainly, when the EFP threat or the the IED threat was is is, is very high. You know, probably when they were throwing the um, Dagon, not so much in Afghanistan, but in Iraq, when they were throwing the uh, EFPs up on the bridges. Remember that when they were doing yeah. that back in o five o six, and what they were trying to do, they would do it in a cross direction, and that's why you used to see people go from let's say left lane or right lane all the way over into the left lane or counter flow where instead of driving with traffic you start driving into oncoming traffic that was another big common thing we did over there in iraq uh but yeah afghanistan very few bridges there are a few but like i said a few uh, mostly it's just flat well not flat it's mountainous but you either have hard pack or you have scrub and in uh like Pangier river valley um, I went on some sheer ass driving paths that you had maybe six inches from the side of the wall to a drop off. There are no, um, what do you call them? Uh, guardrails. You will fly right the fuck off of it. If you, if you go too far or that ground breaks, that's when you're, uh, get nice sphincter cl clenching time. If you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a good, a good few places like that in Bosnia back in the day, um, and a lot of a lot of sort of that driving through certain areas of Afghanistan did remind me of all those years ago where I was like looking, I was thinking, what's all those like red and blue fucking little dots at the bottom of this mountainside? Then you realise fucking hell, they they are actually vehicles, you know, where people have just driven off and fucking tumbled down this mountainside. So yeah, it does get you um, the blood pumping, the blood pumping a bit. But again, there's there's no real way around that. Um, and obviously, we're at a disadvantage, especially sort of the British and Americans, um, rather than using local vehicles out there, because most of the vehicles, that are, uh, most of the places out in Afghanistan are, are built for donkeys and cattle and and light vehicles, like pickups and stuff like that. They're not meant to be taking. 20 tons worth of weight you know so again there's always that threat and again the big killer especially where we were operating um in in southern southern afghanistan and helmand was um the rollover a good few people lost their lives because vehicles were rolling over into canals and such and just people were just drowning you know so we we did invest in in um what we called the Rodette, the role of a drill egress trainer that we bought from you guys actually and it's just like it's like the mrap hull and basically, it turns upside down, and you get you, you get the crews out and all stuff like that, and then the train to get the um, like the the inj the casualties out and stuff like that. And um, I used to train people on that as well. And I had a good few people like maybe a year down the line, I'd bump into them somewhere, and they're like, "You took me on this. You took me on the the road the road debt trainer." And I actually was was in a vehicle rollover out in Afghanistan. We were upside down in water. And because of what you trained us and that training that we were that we were given, actually we all we all got out alive. So it's like a big handshake. And and again, that's that's the reason I was doing it. It's not because I like standing in front of people talking. It's at the end of the day I want I want people to be able to go out there and do their job and, and get on to their families with a big tick in a box on, on mission accomplishment, you know. Oh yeah, they um, they had um sorry to interrupt. Uh they had a um these pickup trucks they would bring the training for state department they still did it on my last uh trip over to uh afghanistan except these were set up in place permanently but what they were was basically a mock-up of an mrap and the other one was a mock-up of a hummer and it simulates going side to side and then it gives you the wild upside down flip and then you know you have to until you've done it uh, and you learn how to brace and coming down like the first time I did, man, I hit that uh, I hit that roof pretty hard with my back. You know, I was like, I think I got it here, and it's like the dynamics are totally different because it's a foreign environment, and it mm. does pay off because you know I don't care how many times you've driven a car when your perspective is upside down, it's changed. It's kind of like. I had a Ford Escort when I left the Army. I sold my uh, Volkswagen Golf GTI, which is about the same size as the Escort was when I bought it. And uh, anyways, 
I took that daggone thing to, um, uh, where was I coming back? Oh, I was going to Kings Bay, Georgia. And, uh, then I came back. I was home on leave, went down to see, uh, some people I knew in the Marine Corps. And, uh, went down there and came back. And as I came back, going through Kentucky, it was dark time, you know, night. And, uh, there was a rock in the road. And I thought, well, I'll miss it. And I thought I did miss it. And I hit my tire and made it blow out. Well, there was just a little, um, not little, but between the mountain, they, they'll have like a pit where the rocks are supposed to land instead of going out in the road. And uh, I, I slid off into that. And so my car was sideways. It wasn't upside down. It was just sideways, sort of like that Hummer I flipped back in the uh, 80s. I think it was 86 when I flipped that Hummer. It went sideways. Well, the Hummers that we were driving back then, the doors were pretty light. So I'm thinking, not a problem. Dude, getting out of a car at the, that's on its side, people don't realize that's a bitch. Instead of rolling down the window and going out through the window, uh, which, you, you know, it was an option for the long-ass side window of an Escort, um, I... I opened up the door I, it was a bitch to hold it up I'm climbing on my seats to get up on it and that the weight of that door was crushing brother crushing I got out alive and everything I mean it's, I'm not bitching about it but I'm saying it, it was work and you don't realize how heavy that car door is until you gotta push up on it and not to the side <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> any training you can do in that, that sort of like to combat that or to insert a set of skills so you know what to expect, it, it's life saving. And we, we saw we saw casualty numbers drop significantly once we started giving that training. I mean, what I used to do is I used to get the crews into um, inside this, this mock up. And once they were in, I used to go around because there was obviously these the front doors, the rear doors, and the turret. Then what I'd do is I'd I'd say, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to do a 90, 90 degree roll. I'd lock the back door so everybody had to come through the turret, you, you know, just that element of, of uncertainty and it creates panic. I said, what we're going to do, we're going to simulate you're going to go into water. So I'm going to give everybody 90 seconds to get out. If anybody's in there, after 90 seconds, they're dead. So there's times that I was having crews out in less than 40 seconds and there's times that crews were just... They just had the wrong person trying the door. They'd try the door, then say, oh, it's locked, without doing it properly because they're upside down, it's dark, they can't see anything. And then they try and get out of another egress point, but they they are locked, you know. So it'd be like five, six minutes. I'm just like, everybody's dead. Get back in, you're going again. Get back in, you're going again. This time we were there for three, four hours doing it, just make, making sure that people could get out on time. But again, it's, it's how long do you put on training where it could save your life? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's priceless at the end of the day. Oh, so, I, I mean, it was good to see that the, the evolve, the involvement in training um, and, and how training came on to the point where it, again, is what can we do to bring people back? And I, I actually did put a, an idea forward. So why, why don't we provide, um, you know, the, the two minute air bottles, the emergency air bottles that you can get. Right, where right. It's just like a, a, a single air bottle size of an aerosol can with the mouthpiece on. And again, it was just a cost issue. It was just like, no, because fucking idiots will steal them. And I'm just like, but again, how, 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 do you, how much do you want to put on, on somebody's life? That that might happen. And no more than, I would say, four months of me actually putting that idea forward, there was a vehicle that rolled in Nari Siraj down in Helmand province, province, and a few people died because it was upside down in water. Um, because, of, again, the enemy, they, they, these people, all, all the mother might live in mud huts and wear fucking flip-flops. Their, their TTPs were, were quite advanced. They're, they learned quickly. You know what I mean? They learned quickly, okay, this is what the Brits are doing, this is what the Americans are doing. What we'll do instead to combat that, we'll do this, we'll do this. So the drills were changing constantly. And they stopped putting IEDs in the ground and they started putting them in walls instead. So they thought, right, we can't defeat the armour 
of all our MRAPs, or what we used to call Mastiffs and Ridgebacks. We can't defeat these vehicles, so what we'll do instead, instead of trying to blow through them, we'll just blow them into the fucking river and let the river do the job for us. So they started burying IEDs in walls instead. So you would drive alongside it, it detonate from whichever way it detonate, usually command wire, which you can't do much about. Um, and that it flipped the vehicle in, into into the water, and, and unfortunately, some people lost their lives. So again, it, it, it was that training kicked in. Um, we were doing a lot more of it just to combat this threat. Yeah, I remember that even with those rollover vehicles we were using for training, the instructors could lock a door here or there, and it was hilarious yeah. to watch somebody keep pulling on their door, and you have to look over at them and say the door is out of commission, you know, to simulate maybe it's yeah. next to a wall, next to a rock, you know, yeah. something it's upside be, down. Upside down. You can't get yeah. out the turret, yeah, because yeah, it's upside down here. Yeah. I mean, they were good as well because they've got uh, IR cameras inside, inside these rollover um, trainers. So the instructor that that stands at the front of it can with the see console, everything. Yeah, can, yeah, he can see inside. He can see, even though it's pitch black in there. Obviously, you can see everything because it's all all infrared in there. So we can see these fucking idiots trying it all, and they keep trying it and trying and trying it. And you don't say anything; you just let them get on with it, you know. Um, but it's when they, they try it all and they don't really try it. It's just like, like they give it a shit. No, it's fucked. Next door, like that's the only door open, my friend. So you're gonna be in there for a while. Yeah, but they are they are good bits of kit. And again, we we actually we we got them from you, from from the the US guys. And we still have quite a lot of US guys come over, um, like civilian contractors, you not know, to to maintain them, and things like that. Yeah, they. So the one useful bit of training that I got, well, not one. There was a lot of useful training I got from the Marine Corps, but I'll never forget one bit where you get disoriented, you flip over in water, and you know you could be coming off of a. a I know one case where an Amtrak, they didn't shut the back door properly, and it flooded and went right down to the bottom of Davy Jones' locker. Uh, I don't think anybody would survive that one, if memory serves. I don't even think the uh, the commander of it did, because, you know, it's all buttoned up, and yeah. you got all that water pressure, you know. The PSI of that water pressure is a bitch. Uh, that hy hydraulic pressure. Um but the one thing that was useful was it looks like a helicopter and you'll flip in it and I only got it to go through it because of WSSI Water Safety Survival School Instructor and um, when I went through that course uh, you go through a helicopter flip right it's a little apparatus that it's on a slide goes into a pool and flips uh, uh, uh how do I put the slide? Almost like a, um, what do you call that? Um, it It's holding you by the sides, drops you into the water, and slides around upside down. I, I can't yeah, really... Yeah, rolls you Yeah, rolls we're, 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 yeah we, we've done them heli dunking drills. Yes. Like the, what all the guys go, you know, the, the guys that work on the oil rigs, they've got to go through it all on the heli dunking drills. Where right. it's like... The, 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 the um, that's a pool that you they do it they can simulate sort of rough weather and all that they can simulate rain they can simulate thunderstorms and wind and the dunk you in upside down and you've got to sort of get yourself out yeah it's it's, it's fucking horrible I've, I've had to do once or twice well this until one... i was just I, I was told don't matter which way you you think you are just follow the bubbles watch always the follow bubbles. your bubbles watch the bubbles yep yeah. this one wasn't that high speed it was outside so i guess if uh the SILs wanted to use it for night training. They'd have to wait till night. You know, you got to remember, this is 80s. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so that, that was something that, that could be useful if you went into, let's say, a river. Um, you would not so much panic. And the problem also is with the SILs. You're not going to get the time of, let's say, a civilian vehicle that goes into the water how it'll slowly sink and you can maybe get out a window or pop the window once the pressure is stabilized um but um you know you don't want to just blast it completely you know you know what i'm talking about brother and yeah. uh but military vehicles do not have the sills that a civilian vehicle. well maybe they do but it gets it gets outweighed by the massive sheer amount of tons 
that are pushing that vehicle down so quickly. And it just seems like uh, there. It's a funny story in Pangier. They were so desperate. The Soviets were so desperate for maneuver room that they would actually drop paras in uh, Spetsnaz in their vehicles. And uh, when they when they dropped them. They have that big pole that fires off the retro rockets at a certain distance. And um, then it was, you know, it would lighten the... And they still had, what, 17% casualties every time they went in that way. Where the vehicle yeah. burned into the ground or something. But they actually uh, landed in the river. We're talking the Pangier River, brother. And those those vehicles and the, and the people, the Afghans didn't bury those motherfuckers. Uh, they're still in the ground or in that river today, and and it's hilarious when you drive by them. You're just like, up oh, there's a BTR sixty right in the middle of the goddamn river, and their little half track looking vehicles. I can't remember what those were called. Those were pretty common in that river too. But they really put a push into the Pangier, and they could never get into the into uh, the Pangier. No, it's like say it's what the Russians were doing and what we were doing. are completely, completely, you know, I mean, different ends of the scale. Like we were having a, a chat, I think it was on the last show, or we were having a chat offline about what they used to do with um, their CBRN, their chemical warfare training, where they used to just dump live nerve gas all over their fucking troops. So if your drills were up to scratch, then one of us would fall to the floor, start body popping, foam coming out the mouth and nose and arse, and yeah, they were fucking savage. But their, their their casualty rates were massive, and it was just accepted. You know what I mean? It was just like, hmm, it's just the old Soviet way. You know, if your drills weren't fucking good enough, then you died, and that was it. But uh, again, and, and obviously they had substandard kit and all that, and it was just uh, they didn't have the sort of trials and development that we were putting in because we we well we like to think that um, we're actually we've got some value. You know, we are human beings. We are just guinea pigs. To bring the next weapon out, so yeah, the, the stark stark differences between what the Soviets were doing and, and what we were doing, and and still to this day, to some extent, you know, I mean, you've just got to look at like the Kursk, the some the nuclear sub, the Kursk, the Russian sub that went down. Um, it, there was there was nations from all over the world offering help. There was a British Army, uh, sorry, a, a Royal Navy vessel um, on the scene within four hours, saying we can help. We can hear the SA West tapping you guys down there, and they were like, "No, no, it's all right. We'll get them. We'll get them. We'll get them out." And uh, and it was basically they were just sit, sitting, and then it all went quiet, and all those people died, you know. And that was all because of pr- the pride of the Russians, um, and nothing will ever change. Nothing will ever change him to this day. So <clears throat> again, again, it's just the, through the way that they do business. Um, but like moving on, moving on to that sort of some of the kit that we're using on the ground for the weapon systems and things like that. And I know we've touched on this before, but the uh, just the, the normal rifle that the average soldier carries now is a lot different from the rifle I was issued when I first joined the army. You know, um, for all its faults, the SA 80 a one. And no matter everybody who listens to this has heard the horror stories of that piece of shit weapon. Um, and it was uh, an absolute piece of shit weapon. It was rushing to service. And the reason why it was rushing to service um, was for a number of reasons. We were carrying around the what we call the SLR, but it was the uh, Belgian FN, the FAL, um, the fucking big elephant gun, which was in 7.62. Um, we didn't have the automatic version. We had the semi-automatic version with 20-round 20, 20, 20 or 25-round magazine. Um, and what you hit with that stayed fucking hit. It it, it blew people apart. Um, all you've got to do is ask the Argentinians um, because it was used against the Argentinians to great effect. It actually brought down more aircraft than our anti-aircraft systems. Um, the, the like Marines and Paris brought down more aircraft using 762 um, small arms weapons than they did actually using anti-aircraft weapons, which is quite interesting. Um, and it was sort of after the after the sort of um, the Argentinian conflict or the Falklands conflict, as we should say, um, that it was we were in Northern Ireland. We'd been in Northern Ireland for quite a while, and you start putting seven six two rounds down a high street of a city. You know what I mean? It might hit what it's gonna hit, but that it doesn't stop there. You know what I mean? So obviously we had issues of 
um, shoot through and things like that. And um, what were the Americans cutting around with the 556? Five, five, Obviously, you guys had been using 556 five, since sort of Vietnam era um, with the old M16 air ones. It was sort of deemed um, the right thing to do because 762, it's, it's a heavy weapon, it's a heavy caliber. You know, you can't carry much of that ammunition. And it only, it, when you shoot someone, it takes that person out and they're dead. You know what I mean? And obviously, the main aim of, of, war against the soviets was it's all about attrition it was taking out more of them than they took out of us and it, it was it was seen that you shoot someone with a five five six the chances are it's not going to kill hit them and kill them with one round so it, it, it creates a casualty and then that casualty will need two people to remove that casualty from the battlefield so in, in essence you're removing three people from the battle um it's a lighter weapon system you can carry more ammunition that means resupply. They can resupply you more. It costs less with fuel because you're carrying less weight. Uh, you're doing fewer resupplies and all that good stuff. Um, so again, and, and we didn't really have the issue with shooting through to a certain extent in Northern Ireland. Um, and let's be honest, we weren't shooting that many people in Northern Ireland, contrary to the belief. Um, and it was sort of up until like Afghanistan and places like that where we were thinking maybe seven six uh, sorry five point five six isn't the caliber to be going with because the ranges that we're engaging um, were beyond sort of the capability of five five six. If you were hitting something, it generally didn't go down. It needed more than one round. So again, we, we sort of adopted a lot more seven point six two weapons within our our fire teams. Certainly with the what you call the 240 Bravo, but we've had since the, Jesus, since the 50s, 60s, what we call the GPMG. Um, we have, we've always used those and we always probably will use those. But then we started um, using um, what we call the sharpshooter rifle. It's, it's like you, you've got the um, M110 over there, which is the, like the rated M4. Um, well, it's off the AR platform. I don't know whether you call it an AR-15 or an AR-10. I don't know what you'd call it, but the militarised version of them, um, the M110, which is in 7.62. We, we have we, we have one, the L129, right, which that is was, an awesome bit of kit. That was the um, AR-10. I know what you're talking yeah. about. That uh, You guys bought a lot of those and got, uh, I think you got actually under licence because for a time it was only the Portuguese... And a couple units in India that actually purchased that under license from Armalite, if memory serves. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that we we sort of like sort of turned around and went, we need something else, something between a normal rifle and a sniper rifle that can be used as both. It can be used as a marksman's rifle, so we, you can drop targets at 600 meters plus, or you can stick it in the shoulder, kick a door in, and and, and engage targets from 10 15 meters away uh, and probably even closer um, i know it was it was used to great effect in compounds and things like that so we brought up sort of the um l129 which is a 762 and it's it, 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 again it looks like the m4 on steroids um <clears throat> well you guys had a shorter so, version of it too though i mean it wasn't as long barreled if memory serves from seeing them over there i remember they weren't quite as long as the original ar-10s I, I no. one, one thing that you're right about I we all had to sit through this in a in a state briefing um some unit went out there I can't remember who they were I think maybe Dynecore I could be wrong on that somebody will remember this but there was a video that their dash cam copied everybody in the vehicle except the one had um uh, MP5s and they got hit by a uh, PKM ambush and their vehicles were not hard cars and um, anyway so the one guy who didn't have an uh, MP5 had a old bolt action Mauser he was the only one that had rounds that went anywhere near the weapons platform that was they all got killed because just the sheer volume of, of, of firepower but you can see they all when it were going up to the next vehicle, which was a hard car, and you can see them falling down like flipping bowling pins, as you know. Yeah. But the one guy with the rifle stood right by that engine block and tire, so you know that 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 7.62 by 54R round didn't punch through that engine block, obviously. But um, 
it finally got him you know I, I, if memory serves it was a, a headshot or a sh or a heart shot because his body twisted so i can't remember which type of shot it was but i'm sure some idiots uploaded it to youtube somewhere and somebody will be able to see it and they'll you know correct me on anything that i got wrong but i think it was a dinocore team maybe a, a shark team before they got all the up armored yeah no it's um uh, let's say the old the old models are, it was what was the models it was like an old nine millimeter but it was obviously a line nine millimeter long cart which i think wasn't it um i can't yeah, remember yeah it was remember. a um it was an eight point something millimeter yeah, eight point is it eight yeah eight eight point nine millimeter so it was it. some weird yeah. fucking caliber on it yeah, yeah yeah and but the yeah. round is massive i mean it's yeah it, it, it's just like the first time I fired a, uh, what you guys had was a, uh, uh, what was it, uh, uh, SMLE, an infill. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I, I fired a thirty out six. I fired the, uh, a sto uh, you know, the um, um, Gavia rifles, uh, 98Ks, and... That small package, that bullet, even though it has a rimmed cartridge, which is unique for uh, that, it almost looks like a big 22 round that's pointy. Uh, we did penetration tests with this out in the desert, and uh, we were out there just shooting a bunch of us Marines back in the day, and uh, everybody brought their toys, and uh, I was shocked by the penetration that that old SMLE had. And... Uh, for a time, I owned a uh, jungle carbine and should never have sold that because that was worth a lot of money and I didn't get that much out of it. But it's just one of them fun facts from back in the day, you know. Yeah, the old uh, Lee Enfield. Let's say with the old Lee Enfield, mate, we'd had, we'd had for God knows how many years. I, obviously, I, I'm not that old, so I was never, um, I've never issued one of those. Um, obviously, that was the pre predecessor to the SLR that we'd had since the 50s and 60s. So, no, the 60s, I think. So, yeah, it was, it was again, a very good rifle. Um, but the rifle, let's like, say, that I was issued, the LH5A1, or the SA-80, as it's, it's commonly known as, was absolute fucking lump of shit. Um, and there's a place in, in the UK, in the north, northern England, um, I can't say where it is, but it's um, situated in the city of Leeds, and it's big, basically the biggest private collection of firearms in the world. And and they've got things there from, from the old patent office. They've got, like, say, the first Lee Enfield in the patent office, still with a wax seal on it. Um, and they've got just weapons from all over the world. I, I know I've mentioned before on one of the shows where there was Sergeant Major Plumley from the, um, from I can't remember what unit it was. I know it was Air Cav. Where it was from the film with uh, Mel Gibson and right. Sam, right. Sam, Sam Neill in it. Yeah. Where he, Sam Major Plumley, well, he, obviously he, he was he was taking out the VC and the MVA with his 1911, and obviously when when he either ran out of rounds or he got a, a jam on it, he picked up the AK um, from one of the fallen enemies and started taking out the um, the enemy. And then when they were leaving, he gave that AK to the ops officer, not ops officer when he came through to the UK. Um, basically, they were doing a big amnesty of the of the weapons, and that was one of the weapons. Um, that was that was in there. Anyway, I, I, I digress. So I, I, that was quite interesting to see. No, see that no, go my hands on it. go on with that because tell the people you've told me offline what famous gunfighter uh, his gun is actually in that museum, and tell them the st backstory because this is a funny story, and and the guy ended up in South America, and blah blah blah. You know the story. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the, there was sort of that 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 AK forty seven there, and it still got the um, because a lot of it was Chinese and a lot of it was Russian sort of um, produced and and given to the the North Vietnamese, the communists. So it still has the Russian the Cyrillic markings on on the butt of it. Um, but again, in this museum, you get given this these set of cotton gloves, um, obviously because sweat creates rust and rust kills wet metal. Um, so you're going round here. And um, the, 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 the lady that runs it, really, really knowledgeable re lady, she turns around, she goes, oh, do, do you want to see some really old guns? Okay, yeah. She gets all these really old guns out, like the old six years and stuff like that. And then she opens up um, this this case, and it's just these big, pig-iron 
occult peacemaker things, you know, and she just goes, oh, have a look at these, and you're holding them in your hand on the fucking massive the way a ton. She goes, do you know how much they're worth? Ooh, it was like, you know what I mean? They look like agricultural pieces of metal, you know, like the old tools. And you're like, yeah, not much. And she goes, they're, they're priceless. They're actually um, Billy the Kid's pistols. The, the, the old outlaw, Billy the Kid, she said, yeah, they were, they were Billy the Kid's pistols. Um, they don't know how they've got hold of them, as in how they came to the UK, but there was a private collector, it was an American collector, um, that moved to the UK, I think. Um, so, so the story goes, and he and he passed away. But it, it was from, um, he was like a descendant of of was it, was it Billy the Kid or Butch Butch Cassidy? I, I can't remember which one. I believe to, it was Butch it was Cassidy. Cause, yeah, I believe it was Butch Cassidy because that's what yeah. I think you told me. And it, the American yes, collector yes. went fact, down South in fact, America. But, but, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. That that's yeah. that's yeah. So I, I, again, I think it was. Um, an ancestor that had obviously been handed down through the family that they were his, they were his pistols and there they are in this museum. And then she's got this, this other box. Um, and again, these are like, you can see that these are actually refined pieces of, of handiwork handmade. And again, the, the cult pistols, and it looks like they've been dipped in, in Cerakote. They, they are that shiny and that black. And, um, there's, um, an engraving of a ship going over rough seas on the, um, actually on, on the pistols themselves. And there were actually pistols handmade by Samuel Colt. And it's the only set in the world. And they are absolutely outstanding against they're, they're in that museum. Um, so there's, there's yeah, a lot in that museum. Cool. Anyway, the going, going back to the story, uh, when we're there, they tell you the history about British army weapons, obviously because I was a British army soldier. Uh, and just as a point, this this private firearms collection, it's um, it's only accessible by um, military personnel, armed forces, um, certain police forces, as in certain elements of the police, like our, our sort of like firearms officers, and certain sort of intelligence agencies. So they're only the only people that can go in there. They they do sort of like lend um, out different museums from the, from the collection and places like that. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, they tell you about this this SA80 that we were issued, um, and there's 95 tests that a weapon goes through, and it has to pass 78 of them to be fielded. Such was the rush to get the SA80 into service; it only passed something like 43 of these tests. And every piece of paper said, "Do not field this weapon. Do not this field this weapon. Field, field, field." Now, because of the the sort of um, the, the the poor economy at the time. We need. We didn't want to be buying the um, M16. We didn't want to be buying another Belgian weapon. So it was sort of pushed through, um, much much to the sort of disagreement of of most um, high ranking members of the armed forces. But it was just basically suck it up, motherfuckers, um, and we were given this weapon. Um, we didn't actually realise how bad it was until we actually started using it in the desert. Um, obviously, the the in in, in the first Gulf War, especially, it was a it was a bag of shit. But especially when we started, we went back in two thousand and three um, to Iraq, where it was basically it, it was just it was just useless. It was just you firing three rounds, you'd get a stoppage. Firing another four or five rounds, getting a stoppage. It was just absolutely fucking baggage. Um, so a lot of the guys were actually picking up AK forty sevens that the enemy had dropped because it was a tried and trusted weapon system. And again, until it got back to sort of the mainstream media that the British Army rifle, which is a British rifle, we're meant to have pride in it, is actually made of fucking chocolate. Um, and our guys are picking up 50, 60-year-old Soviet weaponry that something was done about it. And I was actually on the trials and development team at the time when um, Heckler & Koch, which again at the time was owned by BAE, came in to sort of do an overhaul on the weapons because we were looking at different weapon systems. Um from the M4 carbine to the Steyr Org, G36, um, the SIG uh, weapon system. And we, we actually said we were just about to get the uh, HK36 um, until Heckler & Koch was, was procured by um, BAE. And instead of chucking millions of pounds at a new weapon, they said, well, why don't we sort this one out? And they took um, like a slice across, the, across all three services of weapon systems. And I just remember one of the... Heckler and Cox or Conads, these weapon scientists, 
held the weapon in his hand by the obviously the pistol grip and he got the top half of the weapon the obviously the bolt carrier and and, and the, the barrel and the breech and he just locked it from side to side and he burst out laughing he said how the f-? well he didn't obviously swear but he basically along the lines of how the fuck can you guys hit anything with this piece of shit um so it was overhauled to the SD8 year two which became a hundred percent um a better rifle you know after Heckler and Cock had basically done take take it to pieces and put it back together, um, although it was a little heavier because now we we had um, metal Picatinny rails and such, but the the weapon worked. Um, and anybody who used the SA eight A one and then the SA eight A two, it's a completely different weapon system, absolutely, completely different. Um, and then we're on the A three now, um, which again has got a lot more sort of different furniture. We're we're rocking different sites because again we weren't from the um the one that you, you've probably seen on the old sa80s the susat where you look through it it was like the post the post site it was like a black donkey dick and it fucking went up to a point which again was all right when you're standing in a trench picking russians off at three four hundred meters but when you're kicking in the door and you're trying to engage a target fucking six meters in front of you it was it was crap because this post filled a good 40 percent of your site picture so we were rocking the ACOG for a while. Um, and again, the ACOG was just costing too much money. Um, and then there was the sort of all the all the kickoff about the Bible scriptures being on it. Um, so the British Army or the British Armed Forces dumped the ACOG and said, we're not, we're not going to use that because we can't be rocking around with um, Bible scripture on it. We're not as, 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 as a religious nation as, as the US. So... M- even though we swear allegiance to God and the Queen, um, we couldn't be seen going around dealing out justice because, it, you know what I mean, a lot of the left wing were saying, oh, it's like the Crusades again, you know. So, um, and it was a cost issue as well. It was a cost issue. ACOG, is it Trigicon that make ACOG? Weren't giving it us a, a, a sort of like at cost, you know what I mean? Because we were buying in bulk. They said, no, you will pay um, off the shelf price as you would as, as a private buyer. So, again, we said, okay, then we can fucking scrap your contract. And we went to the Al- the Alcam Spectre um, that you see most of the um, American SF using these days. So we went to that, which we, we don't call it the Alcam Spectre. We call it the LDS, the lightweight day sight. And it is just an amazing piece of kit. So, it, again, nowadays, they're listening to the guys on the ground. It's not like we've got this sight for you. It's shit. Well, if you don't like it, unlucky, you're using it. They're actually fielding and, and testing weapon systems now that are t- fielded and tested by the people actually using them, quality, so which, is, which is good. Quality kit. It's just like yeah. <clears throat> it's just like you're talking about the ACOG. The first gens of them, I wasn't a fan at all, and uh, but I did become a fan very quickly of the heads-up display that you have it's more of a squarish looking piece of kit with like a little uh hood over it and it has a floating um red dot red well it's not just a red dot it actually was like a sight and so no matter where your eye was on it you're hitting what you're what's in that crosshair yeah once you get it fine-tuned in and uh the interesting it's great for you know nighttime it's great for daytime you can adjust the brightness um the the trick is though once you're out of batteries you're out of batteries and i'm always Mm -hmm. a fan of iron sights even at night you know it it doesn't bother me i've used iron sights forever yeah i may be nearsighted to read but i can see perfectly fine from any firearm sight you know whether it's a pistol or a rifle it just because of the distance and you've got to have a clear front sight post because the tip of where that sight post is once it's set that's where your bullet's going to hit and uh, that's just a fact. If you've got everything your everything correct, and you have that complete clear front sight post, you're gonna hit every time, and um, right where that post is. So if there's a fuck up, it's usually human engineered. Um, it's not the weapon. It's the it's the it's not the dope on the weapon. It's the dope behind the weapon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. human, human error causes this shit. But I found an attachment through, um, I think it was OpticsPlanet.com. 
and you just used it through your M4, that little hole that they got on top for all the optics that go on top of it, usually within the sight picture, and it's it's got a screw that embeds down in it. Then you can adjust your drop, so you're able to see your sight picture, iron sight, and that red dot, and it's super easy to co-witness. And uh, I was looking for it just a second ago. I always forget the name of this damn thing, and I just had it out the other day. And now I can't find it. It's a. Uh, it wasn't the ACOG. I'm trying to look for it now. Give me one. Why don't you talk while I look? Because I'll find it. Was was it the the EOTech? Yeah, it's an EOTech. That's what it is. Yeah. EOTech. Yeah. And and it was like first gen. The yeah. ones that I used later. Now the ACOGs. By the time I was in Afghanistan in 2010, I believe it was, was the first time I got to see the the newer ACOGs. Those mm. things are bulletproof. And yeah, that's what that, that's that, that's that's when we had them around about 2010. Yep, yep. It's it's bulletproof, brother, and uh, I love I love it. Um, it. Easier to use with night vision. Um, it's just everything about it was a lot better um like i could have gotten i was gonna upgrade and i decided not to once i used an acog and uh i was gonna upgrade to the um we just said the name eotech with the uh ir site and i said what's the point acog's got it right and they have yeah. that uh night vision adapter device that you just sling down behind it you know which one i'm talking yeah. about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect. So it's a perfect system. It's just two pieces, and whatever it is, it is, and you can still co-witness with it. That's another advantage. So, yeah. anyways, that we I guess we've talked enough about rifles. Um, now, I will say during the Gulf War, the majority of the military police in the provisional uh, company, military police pro provisional company, or Procoy as you guys call it, uh, they were carrying still the uh, SLR, self-loading rifles. Mm. And um, then they also had, half of them had still the 9mm um, Sterlings. Yeah. Yeah. And Not the Sten, yeah, the, the, the um, fuck, what were they called? Sterling. Yeah. But yeah. The, 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 we, we call, we, I can't remember what we called it, something. We called it SMG. Was it SMG? Or something? I can't remember what we were calling it. Black, Blackie will know. Yeah, Blackie would know, and I should too. I When I was working with them, and we first started going out on highway patrol with them, and they would give me uh, one of them because they always had a couple extra. Because you guys made them, I think they were like 20 bucks a pop to make yeah. in your guys' country. So they're, they were everywhere. And uh, they'd always have a couple extra in the vehicle, and they'd give me one, and they'd be like, you're sitting in the back door with the door open. And that's where I learned to read the street. You know, I learned that, you know, it's better to be open, and windows were always down with them boys. And I'd be in the back of that damn Land Rover with the door. Uh, there was a way that you guys have that you could secure the vehicle. I think it's like an attachment to the door that, like, allows – a swinging little peg to come out yeah. and hold it with a ball on the end of it, if a memory serves. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that's how they held the door open, and they wanted to know if somebody's rolling up, they're like, shoot them. And I was like, all right. And uh, but I still had my AR. I mean, my M sixteen A two. But you know, it was just more sensible to have a smaller weapon platform in the back than my you know I can get to my M16 it was right next to me but you know if I needed to use it quick round out of that and then I can grab for my M16 so anyways um, maybe we can hit on um, uh, load bearing equipment would be interesting I think because that is a part of the uniform once you're in the field and the transitions that we've seen within that yeah so Again, we, we used to have what we call the old 58 pattern, which was um, it was all the, the old canvas stuff that the old and bold used to wear. Again, I didn't really see that. It, most of it had been phased out. There was still the odd, the odd one or two guys that were using um, some 58 pattern kit. It, it, 
you know, integrated into their belt kit. But our belt kit hasn't really changed um, over over the over the past sort of like twenty thirty years. Certainly the twenty years. Um, and again, it, it's usually just the guys on the ground that have sort of adapted to the environment and either bastardised what they've had or made their own. And th- there is actually quite a, a, a big sort of thing in the British Army where uh, it's probably a good thing, um, um, but it's maybe not seen as a good thing. I know there was a, a comment by an American general that the British Army units that were holding ground in Afghanistan always looked like defeated units um, just because none of us were really wearing the uniform that we were issued. It was either fucking bastardised, held together by tape, you, you, you know, or guys were wearing mixed dress to a certain extent. They were wearing sort of the normal desert bottoms, but then they were wearing a civilian North Face T-shirt and, and such. And I know a lot of the sort of like, the, the not so much the ground-holding commanders of, of the US military, but certainly sort of your your sort of hierarchy up the chain were itching, itching just to fucking grab one of our commanders and say, make you guys dress smartly. But obviously they couldn't because it's a completely different nation, a completely different militaries. Um, and again, there was that there was that element of sort of um, envy to a certain extent that a lot of us were allowed to cut around with beards and, and the such, where a, a lot of the, um, certainly like the 82nd Airborne guys that were attached to us all had to, you know what I mean? Um, I think the only thing that they were really allowed to, to sort of pick and choose was their own boots. But again, there was sort of limits to that. So again, there was all like that element of envy, and any time that they were coming on the ground with us, we ensured that, you know, look, you dress how you want to dress as long as you can do your job. If you want to go out with t-shirt and body armor, don't give a fuck. We're going out with t-shirt and body armor, but we don't want to wait when you're whinging that you you either sunburnt or you've slashed your elbows to pieces when you've when you've gone into a prone position. Um, so again, our belt kit is uh, has changed over the years. Um, and the British Army has sort of like lived off its belt kit. We've always been known um, that our webbing just stays attached to us at all times. Certainly, again, that comes from sort of like the, the our, our our follies in 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 the Southeast Asia, in the jungles around there, where um, your belt kit is basically your life support. On there is your your, your ammunition, your water, and your your parang, your machete, your cookery, whatever you've got. Um, so again, that hasn't changed. We've always been taught to fight from old belt kit, and anything else that we can attach to us is just a bonus. Where um, I know for a certain period of time, um, certainly, uh, again, again, my, my my experience with the 82nd Airborne lads, a lot of theirs was sort of chest mounted, body armor mounted, which is fine if you're in a vehicle, but again, it's not that fine if you're sort of light infantry and you're on foot and you're you, you're laid on your front quite a lot. Um, and I know that certainly I'll, I'll give him a shout out, Bo. I won't mention his second name because um, I know he's still, still, still. Well, he's not in the military, but he's he's doing other things. Um, very good friend of mine from Georgia. He um, he actually bought a set of British Army webbing um, online, and he used it out in Afghanistan. And once he started using it, and he, and, and the guys in his team sort of thought it's right, a fucking good bit of kit. Though um, we were getting them all sorts of bits of kit from the UK. So our belt kit has always been sort of really high quality, and it's always been individual. Not not what every soldier will have different belt kit. It's non it's not it's non uniformal. Um, and again, what they've tried to do nowadays with the belt kit is, is sort of make it a a uni not so much a uniformal thing, but um, they try to actually issue it where it's modular instead of the guys getting their own belt kit and then sending it off to get. Um, tailored and, and the such because it, it's sort of a big thing in the in the british army we like to have tailored kit like our rucksacks our bergens um a lot of the guys will have tailored with extra pouches on the back and, and, and things like that well but now they're trying to that's why they're trying to watch go on that's why london bridge exists i mean yeah. that was some of the best kit until kifaru came out but these are all civilians that geared towards military stuff like right now I mean, I still have my old LBE, my load-bearing equipment from the 80s. Um, yeah. But, see, I was fortunate. I scurved and scrimped and, and got 30-round, 20-round magazine pouches 
that were made out of the uh, the canvas. And I got a belt that was made out of the canvas. And same with the uh, suspenders, canteen cover, or canteen um, cover, and all the other equipment we had to have, all the little pouches. Because as I've said before, nylon melts. It, does, it doesn't burn. This shit will burn and you can pull something burning off you. But if shit's yeah. melting to your body, you know, that shit's going to stick once it melts. And even when we progressed to the LBV, load-bearing vest, and it was in woodland camo, we thought, damn, this is the bee's knees until the first time you have to assume a prone position. And then you get barrel-chested with all those magazines. There's no joy yeah. in that. And so, you know, you just have a lot of people carrying the uh, uh, the LBV, the belt, and all their kit on it. That's where I did learn that from the uh, English mer military more than the U.S. military. Because before then, I used to carry uh, my long blade on my belt kit, okay? And... Uh, one of the Brits I was with, I can't remember, a blonde-haired, ruddy-looking dude, um, he, he, he comes up to me and goes, why do you have that on your belt? What if you have to drop your belt? Then you don't have your knife. And I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. He goes, put it on your inside belt. And you know what? Because it dropped far enough to clear the belt, you could still access it. So, just little hints, trip, tricks, and and knowledge that was passed down and mm -hmm. and then once we started putting shit in our vest and I'm uh, because we were driving a lot and but see it's also on the armor so you go assume a prone position you know you're you're daggone digging it into the armor not into your chest so much it sort of spreads the uh, effect no more bruising um, but I remember the uniforms when I came in just to quickly update, uh, we were issued like one pair of uh, the sateens, which were the tight looking uh, greens. I still have the baseball cap. I have my sateen shirt too, and it tucked in. And that was, uh, I think they called them OG 108s, but they got, uh, you couldn't wear them after October 31st of 1986, if memory serves. And um, then, uh, but also while we were going through basic training in AIT, we were issued the Woodlands. And at that time, uh, they were just the heavyweight, and I still have those. They're more like a wool blend. And then uh, those were awesome for the winter, plus your filled pants and your filled jacket, your M65 filled pants and filled jacket. You were good in the winter, and unless it got really, really cold. And then the, you had wool pants. I still have those in my wool jacket, or wool, uh, well, we call it a jacket, but it's actually like a, a shirt. And that was in green. They weren't camouflaged. Um, just that OD green. And uh, let me see what else was there that uh, stands out to me. Then I remember in 86, I believe, they came out with the ripstop nylon I don't know if it's nylon, but it's a poly nylon blend or something like that. Nylon poly blend, I think it was what it was called. I'd have to pull out one of them and look at it, but it says what it is in the tag of it. And uh, those were fucking awesome. And I uh, had that the rest of my time, even through the Guard and the Marine Corps. Wore that uniform, except difference. We didn't have name tags in the Marine Corps. We just had the Eagle Globe and Anchor on the right pocket with the USMC. Uncle Sam's Misguided Children, Uncle Sam's Musket Club, uh, whatever you want to call uh, the United States Marine Corps. Uh, then went into the Guard, still wore that uniform, got out uh, right before I went to my first federal agency, and that's when the ACU hatred came out. And uh, they started letting everybody in the military wear berets, which was gay as fuck. And, um, that was the end of my military clothing and equipment shit to talk about. I mean, cause really, you know, I didn't, everything after that's just, uh, you know, basically civilian. I got to check out a bunch of that stuff, but we're not to that point yet. So 
rock on with what you're saying. If you want to cover, oh, pistols, as a military policeman, since the time I was 17, you know, I carried, and uh, there was a saying in the Army back when I was in, uh, no other place in the United States of America can an 18-year-old carry a pistol on his hip and enforce the law except for the United States Army. And the Marine Corps really has a cutoff of like 20 until they'll let you become a military policeman. So, anyways, I'll let you start to wrap this thing up and then we can uh, uh, adjourn and do another um, show here in a little bit, you know, another time. Yeah. So going on the pistols, um, when I joined, we had we had the uh, Browning High Power. Um, I love that pistol. And it's always, it'll always have like a special place in my heart. I've got an affinity for it because it's the pistol I carried um, throughout sort of Northern Ireland and things like that. And it was just, I'll tell you what it was for me, it was reassurance, especially when you're working plays, plain clothes, when you're working in Northern Ireland and you're in, um, let's be honest, it's a non-permissive environment. West Belfast is a non-permissive, well, most Northern Ireland is a non-permissive environment if you're a British soldier in plain clothes. Um, and again, because we couldn't carry our rifles on us because we're in plain clothes, we're meant to be covert. It was just that reassurance, feeling that thing on your hip or down the back of your jeans, you know. Um, and I carried it when I when I was in Recky Platoon. I carried it when I was in, in Bosnia. I carried it. Um, and it's up until sort of like the later Afghanistans where we got rid of the Browning um, and we switched for a, a period of time to the SIG 226. And I fucking hated it. I didn't like it. Mine went click instead of bang one day when I really needed it to go bang. And after that, I was just like, I, I refused to carry that pistol. Give me um, give me my Browning back, um, of which there was very few. Um, and it wasn't because I'd not prepped it for firing, yada, yada, yada. I think because the rounds we were using with the plus P's, um, the pistol just couldn't take it. It wasn't as hardy as it, it should have been. Um, and it stress fractured the, um, the firing pin. Obviously, I couldn't see the full length of the firing pin. Um, when I'd obviously cocked the pistol, it had fractured the firing pin finally. And uh, when I wanted it to go bang, it went click instead. So that was re- relegated to the fucking scrap heap. Um, and that, not long after that, we got the, the, the Glocks, the, the new gen Glocks, which again, are just, you know what I mean? You can't beat them. Hardy, battle tested, and they do the job. So, um, yeah, I like the Glock. But if you held the Glock in front of me in the old high power, um, I'd, I'd be tested not to go for the old high power just for, for, for um, the old time's sake, you know what I mean? And let's be honest, if you run out of fucking bullets with a Glock, you're pretty much fucked. You run out of bullets with a high power, you can beat some cunt to death with it because that's like a lump of pig iron. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the, the pistol that we used in the British Army. Obviously, there was the other pistols, the, the small specialised pistols. Believe it or not, the, the well rod still gets used in, so, in some certain... Um, Units, the well rod that the old um, raiding parties used to use in in the Second World War, the truly silenced pistols, where you had to like, sort of unscrew the back, cock it, then screw it back in. You, you know, um, I fired one of those once, and they're just remarkable bit of kit. Completely integrated um, suppressors, man. They just none of yeah. the gas escapes, and as long as yeah. it's forty five caliber, you're already subsonic. Yeah, yeah, they're an absolute sick bit of kit them. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, we don't have time to go into tactics and things like. That. I think that's going to be sort of like to be continued next year. Talk about some of the tactics we use, um, how they've changed over the over the generations, and, and what's influenced those changes. So that 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 could be sort of a show for uh, another time. But again, that that's pretty much sort of the the changes that I've seen over the years. And all I'll say is is to wrap this thing up is it's it's about time that those in charge. And in charge of procurement of kit, listen to the people that are using them, other than the people that are holding the purse strings, which, again, they've, they've got a large influence in things. But the, the, the people that are using them, the people that are going to be using them, they need to know what, what they're going to be using and have a say in how and what they are going to be using. Um, and I dare say it's, it's the same in, in the US for certain certain things. And it's just always, no matter what you get given, the American soldier, the British soldier, will always adapt those those what they've been given to work on the ground. 
Um, like I said, we always operate in our old belt kit, just to go back um, to what we were saying. Um, once we started operating a lot more in sort of vehicles, we were going down sort of more, more the, what I'll say, the US route, where a lot of the stuff started appearing in our chest, you know, like the modular body armour and stuff, of, of which we've got nowadays. Um, so again, we sort of beg, steal and borrow off each other. You know, we, we influence you, you influence us, and it's whatever works, you know, even to the point where it's maybe not service-wide, it might be team-wide, you know, there was things that we were taking from the 82nd Airborne lads, there was things that they were taking from us, and we thought, yeah, well, let's just mash it all together, because this shit works, and, and it enabled us to get our jobs done, and we all came home, you know. So, yeah, it's it's been a great show, dude. It's been a great show, and it's been a pleasure to, to do it. And again, it's, it's probably a show that we could re- reference back to, and certainly we'll be referencing back to it on, on the next one that we'll do when it comes to sort of like the tactics we've used, both as, as military and law enforcement. And hopefully we'll get a couple more people on board um, on the next show that can that can add, because, again, me being not law enforcement, I can't really add much to that that discussion if you know what i mean right that's why i figured we'd do this one and we'll put a pin in this one because we can bring you on on to other programs on different things but we'll just put a pin in this one and i think it was a good show uh i wanted for everybody to hear on the, on this side of the uh, little pond that we have to jump every once in a while to hear what the British development was and what their choices were and what influenced them. And I think you covered that very accurately and well. With that being said, thanks, Baz, for stopping by today, brother. And we had a pretty good, fun chat. And all in all, thank you all for sitting on my big orange couch, drinking your coffee, tea, soda, or adult libation. I'll slowly raise the drawler drawbridge as you all walk out. God bless, be well, be safe. <laughs>